I have to start with uh, saying uh, thank you for every single person who joined uh, us today. Thank you for taking the time after a long day of probably a lot of Zoom meetings uh, to take another yet another Zoom meeting to listen to what I have to say and to what I have to present to you. So big thanks, I'm honored. Let's begin. So my name is May, I'm from Israel. I am a software engineer, I'm a backend developer at AppSplyer. I am currently writing in Node.js and Clojure and in Go. I'm a public speaker and I'm also a sworn Star Wars fan. Woo! <laughs> so that's why, by the way, that's that's the name. That's the name. Multiplayer online game in Clojure, Attack of the Clones, episode two. That's just like the, the name of the movie, just for those who didn't know. It's important for me that you will, everyone will know that. Okay, uh, so my first Clojure talk, what I did was I talked about how I learned uh, closure, what helped me to do the transition into closure. It was called Back to the Future, how 80s arcade games taught me closure. And that's exactly what I did. I developed a few simple games um, in, in closure, like the, you know, a, a few versions of Pac-Man and, and then also a Snake. And I presented at a few conferences. And so in one of those conferences that somebody approached me and uh, he said, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, he said, closure is nice, but if you ever decide to write a multiplayer game, you can't do it in closure. Well, and you know what happens when you tell a developer that they can't do something, right? <laughs> like, I knew I'm gonna have to do it. So I did it. I wrote a multiplayer online game, uh, the backend I wrote in Clojure. It's a hundred lines of code. Woo! I'm so proud of it because it was, it's just so nice. And, and then uh, I also deployed the game and yeah, that's, I did the game with a friend of mine. He wrote the front end. His name is Roy Berkovich. Uh, he's also from AppsFlyer, a very talented developer. Um, yeah, so he did the front end, I did the back end, and today we're going to talk about it. So, um, before, you know what, before I dig deeper, like I, I okay, I have this, uh, I have the, the already the first uh, slide here, but I want to say, I want to tell you guys what we're going to do today, okay? So what I'm going to do today is I am going to talk about how you can develop a multiplayer online game in general. Like, what are the challenges? What do you need to consider? What do you need to think about before you start doing that? And these are things that I think that you should take and think about in, you know, if you just, no matter what language or, or, or architecture or, uh, technology you decide to use. These are the things that you need to have in your mind. And that's the key takeaways that I want you guys to take from today. I want you to take uh, what will, you know, to understand what will be the challenges of developing such a game. And I hope that you will see that it's not that difficult and it's actually super fun. So let's, let's start. <laughs> so multiplayer online game, the first thing that you have to consider uh, will be the architecture. So here are uh, the three, I think the three most common um, architectures that are, are out there. You can see that, uh, that there is the peer-to-peer -peer architecture where everyone sends to everyone what happens. And then there's the client server architecture. And then there's the mirror server architecture, which is kind of, uh, I think a mixture of both, like the two first ones. And Okay, although you can, okay, although it's, it has a very clear drawback to choose the client server architecture and the clear drawback is the single point of failure. And, you know, maybe also you can say the, the high latency. I think still that this one would be the best architecture for someone who wants to just try out and do something like that as a fun project. And that's because, first of all, we have the, the consistency because 
all participants will receive the information from the server and you know that everyone sees the exact same thing. And you know, the other thing about that is cheat almost proof, right? Okay, you can cheat and there are cheats for everything, I guess, but this reduces, okay, the, the amount, the ability to do that. And I also think it's, it's better uh, to try to aim towards less cheating. <laughs> so I chose, like I said, client server architecture, maybe one day if I'll decide to do something bigger, I'll try to go with the mirror server uh, architecture. If I'll try to go to maybe bigger, I mean, in scale more players, but for right now it was enough to have single server. Uh, okay. So what you see over here is what I mentioned before. Uh, it's that we have written, uh, the, like I have my friend, his name is Rui. He's the one who wrote the front end in React. Um, and I wrote the back end in Clojure. Here you have the link to both of our GitHubs. Uh, you can download the code, you can check it out. It's tiny, both the client and the server, it's tiny. Um, because I wanted it to be simple for, for people to try themselves and make something different out of it. Um, yeah. So let's start talking about the other challenges, um, not just the architecture. So here are the main three challenges. I, there are more, obviously, but these are the ones that I'm going to concentrate on today. And I think these are the the bigger ones, okay? So first one is you need to define the game flow, like what's, which, what type of game you're going to do. Um, and then you have to think about how you manage the game state. And I'm going to dig deeper into that a little later, so I'm not gonna talk about it right now. And then the third thing will be uh, defining the client server communication and protocols, okay? So you need to choose the right um, communication type that will be right for you. And then also when I say protocols, I also mean literally the met, like the type the way the messages, uh, will look like when you send them between the client and the server. So these are uh, like more things that you need to think about prior to when you start actually developing. So, you know, and forgive me for the ugly, <laughs> ugly drawing. I'm not, I'm not that talented. That's why I had someone to do the front end uh at this at this game you know uh so when i decided to do the 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 game flow like when i started to think about the game flow for this game um we talked like me and and we we talked about simple game and we went with having two or more players uh walking around the screen in four directions and each of them can collect an item and there will be multiple items scattered around the screen and then this is pretty much it. So what do you need to think about when you decide uh, your, about you know, your game flow? What you need to think about is this. Do you allow uh, you know, a player to join at every, sing every single moment in time? Do you wait for a minimum amount of players? Do you want to have uh, all the players uh, be able to collect every item? And these are just, some of the things that you should think about when you're thinking about your game flow, um, but try to think about it before you start developing the game. So let's dig deeper into managing game state. What are the challenges there? So there are four main challenges. Uh, first one is how do you handle adding a new player? How do you handle player movement? Uh, what do you do if the, a player left the game? and handling game entities. And when I say that, I mean, like, like if you have collectible items, like we saw that I'm going to have, and every item that is not the player himself, maybe they need, you know, different and separate handling than the handling of the players themselves. Okay, so I'm gonna go into each and every point that I just mentioned. First point, adding new player. So this is like a part of the things that you're gonna have to consider. First of all, when a player joins, uh, you're gonna have to show self on the client side. It means that the client side needs to identify himself and to also present that to the user. So maybe if you have all players, you know, if all of them look the same, 
maybe for the self player, you want to have like an icon or something that will make it different, that the player will know that this is me playing and not the other players, right? To differentiate the self from other players. So that's the first thing that you have to do. Second thing is you need to send the current state of the game to the new client. And this is what I said about deciding whether you want to play to a certain amount of players or not. So for us, what we did is we allowed to have, you know, two players and up. What it means is when, a, when, when, the, first players, uh, when the first player joins the game, then there is like a waiting screen and we don't show the game until there, is, there are at least two players on the screen. And it's something that you want to consider because maybe you don't want to allow more players to join at all after a session started. And so this is something that you also want to consider. So what happens to somebody who joins after a session started? Do they wait? Maybe do you, maybe you can divide the game into rooms, okay, or into sessions. So that's why you need to think about what are you going to send to every new player who joins the game? Is he going to get everything that just happened before he joined the game? And this is what happens in my game. Every new player who joins the game, uh, you know, people are already playing the game. So what I have to do is send the entire current state of the game to this player. And then of course, update all other players that a new player joined and present the new players uh, in everyone else's screen. So what happens when a player made a move? Uh, you want to update the player coordinates in the player uh, entity. And so, like I said, remember what we chose to do is to have the, the client server, um, you know, to have one single server uh, architecture that he controls everything. And what it meant is that if a player made a move, what it sent is just the coordinates that, you know, like the how much movement it made, but then the client had to wait for the server to tell it what are the new coordinates? So nothing happened on the player. Not, it's not nice to say, like not like nothing that was not not no work done there. I, I when I say nothing happened on the on the client side, I mean that there's no logic done on the client side. The client will present just you know what the server said, and the client will not make a single move if the server did not instruct it to do so. And Okay, so the next thing you want to do is uh, to check for collisions, maybe with the window or with a collectible item. You don't want the players to run away out of the screen because it's just weird. And then the last thing is that you need to update all players with the new game state. Okay, next thing. What happens when a player leaves the game? Well, that's pretty simple. You need to update the player entity that it's no longer, you know, a, a valid player or active player. And then you need, again, to update all players with the new game state. So it's kind of repeating itself, right? Okay, last thing, um, collectibles. So like I said, anything that is not a player uh, will be, okay, either a collectible, maybe something that you can collect. Maybe if it's an infinite runner, maybe it's just an object that you need to jump above or something like that. So for me, it's collectibles, but actually I want you guys to think about the other entities of the game um, when you start working on it. And what does it mean? What you, you should think about, do you want to have endless collectibles? Do you want to have endless items? Or do you want to have a, you know, a set of items that is predefined, like the amount of the items. Can everyone collect everything? Or maybe each person can only collect certain things. Um, so these are just a part of just a, these are just some of the things that you should consider. Um, and so this is why I said I wrote here, generate collectibles, um, and then handle when collected. Uh, update the game state and the server. So if something was collected, you need to know who collected it. So you need to have some sort of identifier to each piece, right? So, and then you need to update all players with the new game state. Okay. All right, so uh, next thing is now that we talked about 
the logic of the game and things that are more focused about the game itself. Now I'm going to talk about defining a client server communication and protocol. So you need to choose the right one for you. And how do you know what is the right one for you? Well, that's gonna, gonna take just some research. And I'm going to show you what, I, what we chose to work with. We chose to work with uh, WebSockets and it's not always the case, but I think that it will be in most of the time um, from what I read. And the other thing that you need to think about is defining the responsibilities. Like I said, uh, for us, the client had zero, like little to zero responsibilities. Uh, everything was in the hands of the server, all the decisions, all the logic, you know, who's the winner, that's the server to decide, uh, you know, the, the score, everything is done on the server side and the client will only present, but it's not always the case. So you need to see what fits your game the best. To the game, woo! Okay, so my game is called Exceptional Monkeys. And I, because, well, we thought that it will be funny uh, to have a game about exceptions because, you know, it's kind of an, it's a very, it's a sensitive topic <laughs> and uh, those exceptions. And just to tell you one little thing, uh, <laughs> if you develop a game, uh, in a language that throws exceptions, <laughs> okay? And it's also the entities of your game. Uh, be, be aware of that because <laughs> I can, maybe I've had a few moments where I was like, wait, what? And then, oh no, it's just, uh, yeah, I actually generated this exception that's on purpose. That's an entity. It's not a real exception. Uh, yeah, that happened more than once. So, <laughs> Think about it <laughs> when you're developing a game. Uh, if if the language has exceptions in it, like, not sure it's the best idea I've ever had. And this is a good time for a demo. Okay, I'm always very nervous before I do demos, so bear with me. Okay, 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 okay. Let's do that. Uh, da, da, da. Let me see. So, client is already running server right mm -mm -mm. okay da, da, da. and i'll just open the all right have that moment of truth you guys my heart is racing hysterically <laughs> okay waiting for other players to play just like i promised and now let's be another player. Oh, monkeys! Okay. Okay, so for the first thing that I want you guys to notice is this is how a player knows that this is self. Uh, this monkey has a little crown on its, on its head. So you know that this is you. And you see how you have the name of the exception that you're supposed to collect above your head and then you can go around and you can collect so you can tell up there in the top left corner it says you and I collected one uh, exception. I can't collect ex ex exceptions that are not uh, you know my exception. You can also see that I handled the, the boundaries over here that I can't leave the window which is important. You don't want to lose the player. <laughs> That's something kind of annoying. Let's see. And here's the other one. He is also, he is far behind. He's going to lose this time. And yeah, that's, that's the game. <laughs> that's pretty much it. It's not really going anywhere. Um, that's not Skyrim or anything like that. You're, it's not going to be, you know, a whole quest over here. It's just monkeys collecting exceptions. <laughs> and that's it. So, woo! Okay, let's talk about how, how we did it and let's see some code because I think that's, uh, that's going to be super fun. But yay! Ah, that went well! Okay, you saw the monkeys and there was the crown and everything and they didn't disappear and I'm, 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 am I screaming? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna lower my, <laughs> I'm gonna lower my voice now. Okay, let's go back to the presentation and- Can we join the game? What? Can we join the game? 
Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna redeploy it. I had a few <laughs> I had a few changes, and if somebody really really wants to collect collect more of these, um, if somebody really wants to participate in collecting exceptions, uh, then just write to me and oh they and I will send the. I will send the new URL, URL because I've already deployed it before and now it's down <laughs> due to maintenance. <laughs> so I'm going to finish the maintenance and then because I did a few changes in the code for this talk because I, I wanted it to, you know, be nicer. So, but yeah, if somebody wants, I will be more than happy to get a request for the URL. It's going to make me super happy. Let's dig into the code. People, all right. So, client server communication, let's talk about that. Uh, I'm going to start with that. And like I said, now I'm going to dig deeper into each of the challenges that I already presented. I'm going to show you how uh, I implemented it in the uh, in closure, right? So, client server communication, let's start with talking about the messages protocol. Okay, first thing. And okay, what you see over here on the left is the first message that will be sent from the client to the server. The first message will only include the height and the width of the window. And this actually shows you how the client that has, you know, the client doesn't have any room for deciding anything. It just sent me the size of the window and then that's it. The second message that will be sent is from the server back to the client with all of the info of the player and you can tell over here that the client will recognize that this is the self because we have uh we have this field self uh set to true and another thing that i want you to notice is how we also have an id um it's just a it's supposed to be a uuid over here i put something shorter just so it will be better for the slide but it's actually it's actually a UUID generated randomly. And that's because this is how the client was able to differentiate between the different players. Um, and another thing is we started by using the exception type as the thing that will, you know, so each player will have the exception type and there won't be two players with the same exception type, but it made the game a little bit more boring as if it's even possible. <laughs> But yes, <laughs> uh, having, uh, so yeah, so that's why we decide to add the ID part um, in order to identify uh, each player. So, okay, next thing that we have is what happens uh, during the, the, the games. So if a player made a movement, okay, so yeah, sometimes there are mistakes in presentations and you're going to have to forgive me and I'm going to tell you what the mistake that I have. So what you see over here that I wrote player movement message client to the server and I accidentally put again the height, just the height and the width, but actually what I'm sending is height, width, X and Y, like the, the movement of the player, which is missing over here. But believe me, this is what is being sent, not just the uh, height and the width of the window. I'm sorry for this mistake. Um, so every time a player makes a movement, what will be sent is how much movement was done. So let's say that the player went uh, one step. So one step, I just sent one. Okay. And then that's what's going to be sent. I'm not sending new coordinates to the server from the client, right? We're sending like one or minus one, like for the sides. And we're always also sending again and again the height and the width because this is played on a browser. If somebody changed their height and width of the window during the game, we want to adapt um, the we want to adapt the game for it. So that's why I'm always sending four fields and not like it's presented over here. It's going to be X, Y, height and width would be sent from the client to the server. And then what you can see over here is the messages that the server sends back to the client uh, for updating the game state. We have the player uh, with all of the information uh, at each moment. And then we also have the exception. So it's either or, right? Because the exceptions are uh, generated randomly. Um, 
And so for every time a, a new exception is made, we will send it to all of the uh, connected clients and this will be the message. And that's it. So this is what we used. Okay. So next thing that we're going to talk about is WebSockets. That's the actual protocol that I use between the uh, client and the server. And it was, you know, I'm not gonna dig very deep into that because I assume that almost everyone are familiar with it. I'm just gonna go real quick on this uh, slide. So it starts with uh, actually an HTTP request uh, that, and then the connection is upgraded into a bidirect, you know, into a connection that allows bidirectional messages to go from one side to another, like both the server and the client can send messages at all times. And they're not dependent on each other. They're not waiting for the other side to answer. And that's what's, uh, you know, allowing the continuous connection. And, and this is what makes it so easy uh, to do the whole um, thing. <laughs> so then this whole thing is going until one side closes the the channel or the connection and then that's it so in closure i used http kit um i also tried uh another another library before that but then i found uh the documentation of http kit to be the easiest one to understand and it was very you know easy to start working with so i went with http kit um, and these are the three things that I had to do with it. I had to handle incoming mess, uh, incoming requests and then manage active connections and then handle sending messages to all active connections. So, okay, code. Woo. What we have over here is the, these three functions. We have the WebSockets handler and we have the WebSocket routes. And as you can see, I just used uh, a general, the general route as the route for all of the requests that the server is getting. I don't really have anything else other than just, you know, the main route. Maybe if it was, you know, a bigger game or something more complicated, then I could define the specific route that I want, but that's what I did here. And what I want you to notice in the, um, in the WebSocket handler function is that I'm always getting the request and the channel. Channel is the actual connection between the client and the server. And this is what you get over here is a connection that is already formed. So I have two functions that can be called and it's, you know, it's event driven. So either on close or on active and these both are and these are both functions uh, that I use directly from HTTP kit. Okay, that's exactly how it, it's there. And that's why I said that it's so easy to use. Um, and I just went through the documentation and I was able to write that down because it's that easy. And on close what I do is super simple, uh, remove player makes sense. And on receive, I call a function that is called process message and we'll dig deeper into this function now. So process message, what it gets is the connection uh, from where the message came from. And also it gets the message itself. After I parse the message and I, I turn it into a closure map to make things easier, then I check, do you remember how I said that the first message will have the width and the height and then this is how I know that I need to add a new player and any other message uh, will either have just the X and Y or, or it will have also height and width, but you know, like X and Y and height and width. And this is how I differentiate between the first message and all the other ones. Um, so in add new player, what you can see over here is that I'm sending the height and the width of the window and the connection itself. And that is because I am going to use the connection as the key, or let's say, okay, it's better to call it channel, right? Because this is how, uh, th this is the term that is being used in HTTP kit. So the channel will be the key to my map of players. Um, and the 
data of like the value of each key will be the player information. So let's go through this, okay? I have, uh, I have the player's map and I used Adam because in this way, it's easier, like, I mean, not even easier. It's just handled without me having to do anything that every connection, like every time a request to, uh, to update a player comes in, you know, a different part of the map will be updated and it's all handled for me. I didn't even have to do it myself. No locks or anything like that. I didn't do, I didn't need to do that. And it was possible because I used Adam. That was uh, very easy uh, to do. So yeah, Adams, that was, that was a good choice right there. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about Adams a little later um, because I used that again, but I'm going to, but for a different reason. Okay, so now what we want, what I want to show you is how I, like the two functions that I added for handling, uh, sending messages to active connections. So the first function that we have here is called send message. And it's actually, I just wrapped the send message, the send function that I got from HTTP kit. And the reason that I wanted to wrap it was just because I wanted to prettify the, the map, to make it into a nice JSON. Um, so it will be, you know, good for the client, but I could have just used send the way it was, uh, the way it is from HTTP kit, because what you, you see that send just receives the connection, like the channel and the message that we want to send to, the, to this specific connection. And the other function that is very important, and I use this one a lot, is broadcast message. And this is something that happens repeatedly. Do you remember how I kept saying that if you do this, now we need to update all players about the current state of the game. If we have that, now we need to update all players about the current state of the game. So this function does that for me. As you can see, I iterate over all of the active connections with DoSec, because remember, the keys of the player's map are the active connections. So I take each connection and I send everyone the same message. So this is the part where we get a message and we update all players, all active connections about the current state of the game. So that's why that's the other function that I needed to implement in terms of sending messages, right? And then that's it. These two functions, if you have these two, you can actually go and do a chat uh, app if you want, or you can do also, a, you know, another game with this, but this is, this is the logic right there. And then that's it. Do you see how simple that is? You gotta love it. I mean, you can't, you can not love this thing. Although it's okay, it's weird to love so much maybe, but I'm very passionate about what I do. Okay. So next thing, now we're going to dig deeper and see the code of each of these parts that I mentioned um, before. Uh, so first, adding new player. Do you remember these three things that we needed to take care of? Here they are all formed into code. So the first part that, like I said, is that you need to show self on the client side. Right, so this is what you can see over here that I'm doing send message. I'm sending the connect like to the connection that I want to send it to. And I do associate with player and self is set to true. Then what we want to do, we have two do set, right? One right after the other. So the first one will be sending all existing players to the player that just joined, right? And then the other thing that we need to do is to send the player that just joined uh, all the existing entities or the collectibles that are already out there in the game. So these two do sec, if I want to define it in one sentence, this would be updating the new player in the current state of the game. Like what happened so far before you got here? That's what these two do sec are doing, okay? And the reason that I need DoSec is to iterate over all existing players and then also to iterate over all uh, existing items. That's it. Last thing, if you remember, I said that we also need to always broadcast to all other players what happened 
in the game, right? So broadcast message and the message would be the player. So sending the new player, showing this player to all other active um, players. And last but not least, I'm using swap, which is just for the atom um, and swap with a source actually adding the connection as the key and the player uh, as the value. Uh, Bruno, how am I on time? Because I kind of lost track on time. Tell me if I'm good or how much time do I have? Uh, you have uh, about 20 minutes or 20 minutes so. is good. 20 minutes is good because sometimes I look, I lose track of time. I talk a lot. Well, we are not strict on time, so take as much. Perfect. As well. Let's stay here all, all night. night. <laughs> Was that obvious that I'm going to say it? Yes, I got nowhere else to go because it's quarantine. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, so let's move forward. Player movement. Uh, okay, so now that we have a, pl a new player that joined, uh, what happens when a player makes a move? How do we update and all of that? Let's see the function. I love it that they're so small. It's always like, let's see the function. And then it's like three lines of code or four lines of code. I love it. So update player state. What we get over here? is connection and actually, you know what? I now I see this and I'm like, I, sh I shouldn't call it new X and new, new Y because this is what we're getting from the client. And I already told you guys, this is not the new coordinates. That's just how much movement was done, not the new position. So, okay, you can name things forever. Okay, I'm, and me especially, I love changing names of stuff all the time. Like I can rename a function so many times, it's ridiculous. But this, I think this is actually crucial because it's not the new X and the new Y. It's actually, you know, maybe I can call it movement or whatever. I'll think, I'm not gonna start thinking about names right now because it, it will never end. But I hope you got the point. And what we have over here is these three functions are happening one after another where each, um, you know, each time that a function ends and we have the, the result, the result will go straight into the next function. And this is because I'm using the, the thread macro right there. And okay, so I'm starting with move player and what move player will get is the connect, is the player that we're going to have to change. It's going to get the movement that was done on X and the movement that was done on Y and also the connection itself. So that's the identifier. And okay, move player just, um, you know, it, it just calculates the new coordinates and then the result will be inserted into the function uh, which is called collect. We're going to dig deeper into this one in just a minute and after the like moving and collecting was done, then you know what's coming next. Broadcast message, you need to update all players about the current state of the game. So collect, let's see what happens in this function. So we start with having, um, you know, to calculate if a player collected an item and that's what happened in the predicate right there. And also you can tell that I wanted to check if the exception type of the player matches the exception type of the item that you know that it, it uh, touched, like that it collided with, um, and then if an item was collected, then I'm going to go into the do uh, function, and if an item was not collected, I'm just going to return the player um, the way the way it was, okay? Because the new uh, coordinates of the player were already calculated in the move function. And over here, what I'm trying to do is just to understand if an item was collected, if I need to update something else, like the score, and then that's it. I'm not talking about the movement itself, right? So if no, if no collection was done, then I return the, the player the way it was. And if an item was collected, then I need to do a few things. First of all, I need to update the collectibles uh, game state. And we will look into this function a little later when I'll talk about how I handled all the items in the game. And then what we want to do is two things. We want to update the player's map with the new score of this 
specific player. And you can see that I did that using swap again. And then, you know, with a source and I updated the score. And then I also returned, and what will be returned from this function is the last source in the do where the player uh, will be returned with a new score. You know, you see the plus one, then that's it. So yeah, if an item was collected, we return the player with a new score. If not, then it will, the, the player will return just the way it came into the function. Okay, what happens if the player left the game? That's pretty easy. And it's another tiny function. Um, we need to remove it from the player's map. That's it. And then you know what happens next. Broadcast message, update all active uh, players with the current state of the game. Okay, <gasps> we're almost done, but not quite. Like we're getting close. We're getting close to, to the finish line, but this is very important. Um, collectibles. So we talked about how you need to decide how many collectibles you want to have, if you want them to be generated randomly, or maybe you want to be the, you want them to be prepared in advance, you know. Um, so what I did is I went with random generation of, of items and indefinitely, like if I will leave the game open, then you know you can keep on collecting except exceptions forever. And by the way, I called this uh, talk episode two. There was episode one, and I called this uh, talk episode two because I keep adding things to the game. I'm already working on a new version of the game that will have an end because currently this is a game that can go on forever. There are no winners or losers. You just <laughs> collect things forever. So <laughs> I guess the, my next talk will be about having, you know, a more complicated game logic. So over here, you can see how I did that. That's why the game is so simple, because the logic is simple. Because what I wanted to concentrate on was how I do all the synchronization, what, how to work with WebSockets. Like, I don't really care about the, the logic of the game at this point, you know, of development. And this is why I decided to do, okay, let's generate random I, like, items forever. And, you know, I, I inserted as, you know, a sleep, so there won't be too many, because I started with having my entire screen covered with them. So, the logic here is not great. Okay, <laughs> that's the first thing that I want to say. Second thing that I want to say about the collectibles is that you can see uh, if you take a look at the swap function that I'm using after it, right in the inside the let you can if you go down with your eyes, you can see the swap function that I am adding the new value of the exception to a collectibles uh, map and two things that I want you guys to notice here. First of all, uh, the key of the map is, an, as, uh, you know, is a uniquely, uh, is a unique ID generated with UUID, right? And the value will be the value of the exception. And why do we need that? Like, why do I need a unique ID for a collectible? And the reason is because I want to know if an item was collected, then I want, then I need to know, not just if an item was collected, for the player, but I also need to know which item I need to remove from the screen. That's what I'm going to send to the client. So the client will get from me, not just in general, you know, remove something from the screen, but I'm going to be very specific. Remove this, remove the exception with this ID from the screen. So that's what, that's the reason for that ID. And another thing that I want to talk about was the fact that I used atom, like an atom um, also for that. And here's the thing, okay? If I have a, a map and it's, it's, you know, and it's an atom, it means that if many, okay, many threads are trying to update the same map because it's a global map, right? So if any, if many threads are trying to update the same map in different places, then we're all good, right? Because it, it's, you know, it's, it's being handled, no problem there. But what happens if a few players are trying to collect the exact same item at the same time? So we all know that 
it's not exactly the same time there, there will be a like a bit differences in uh, you know of in terms of order and this is where ideally what i want to do is the first person who actually reached the item that will be the person who will grab it and i tried to see because i i tried to see if i can make it happen like if i if i can you know mix the order or if i can mess up the order like it uh, because nothing guarantees the order that it's going to be updated in the atom right it, it something like I am guaranteed that if the items are not connected to each other and I'm trying to, to change the map in different places, it's going to be all right. But if a few threads are trying to edit the same place in the map, the order is not guaranteed. What will happen is the threads that didn't get to edit the map, they will, uh, they will just wait and they will retry again. And we don't know what will be the order that it will be done. So the first thing that I thought was, okay, maybe what I will do is I will add a buffer that will, I will use it as a queue, right? And every message that I get for collecting an item, I will insert that into a queue and then I will only have one, um, one function that will pull out of this queue and it will update the collectibles. And this is how I will maintain the order. First of all, it doesn't, it's still not promising completely the order, but it's, you know, it's a better situation. But the thing is, is that I will cause, and I did cause more latency because now I have only one function updating and I kind of lose the thing that Adam is giving me, you know, out of box. So I kind of gave up on that idea. I did not use a uh, queue eventually. As you can see, I am just, updating things and and I decided to do that because it was really hard to to mess the order it was really hard to get to the situation where where a few um, players are trying like I, I I didn't feel that it's worth the latency that's what I'm trying to say and that's why I went with it um, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts. I would love to hear your thoughts about it. It's still an open question for me. Like I'm still thinking if it's something that maybe I would want to do. I did not go further into it. I'm just sharing my thoughts with you, and you know, it was part of the process. And uh, yeah, so that's it. Updating uh, collectibles. What happens if a collectible was collected? We remove it with DSOS from the collectibles uh, map and broadcast message you already know what's going on there and i guess that's it summary woo okay so what did we have today what did, what did i talk about well i talked a lot but i talked about developing a multiplayer uh online game in general i talked i showed you uh, pieces of my code i shared some of my thoughts things that are still not complete that i'm still thinking about and I would love to hear your thoughts, your comments, anything. If you are so in love with the game that you really want to play with it, that's also something you can tell me, you know, don't be afraid, that's okay. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you guys for listening.